Welcome to Claremont Parish Church for our service for Sunday, April the 25th. My name is Gordon Palmer, a minister here at Claremont. I'm also taking part in the service this morning will be Karen Palmer and Maria Murphy. The service this morning is the third in a series of Beyond Easter, What Next? After Jesus had risen, we had looked at his the fact that he later ascended to the Father, then last week at the gift of the Holy Spirit given to the people of God. And now, we, and today, we look to the promise that Jesus will come again. And they're all linked together. together. And let's hear that in the um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 1 at verse 11, just after that moment that Jesus had ascended. Angels came in to Jesus' disciples and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And picking up on that gift of our Lord Jesus coming and sharing our fragility, dying and rising for us, being ascended and coming again, so the hymn which a hymn that's based on that great passage in Philippians chapter 2, describing these events. The hymn, All Praise to Thee, the words will be on the screen. In our prayer of approach today, there is a response. When I say, magnify the Lord with me, we'll all say together, let us exalt his name together. 
And at the end of the prayer, we'll join in saying the Lord's Prayer. Let's talk to God. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to come before you now, to take our place beside the angels in the heavens and to worship and adore you. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Father, our minds can hardly take in all that you have done for us, creating this beautiful world for us, persisting with loving us even as we spoiled what you gave us, sending your Son who left the glory of heaven to live here alongside us, to suffer and die for us. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love for us, that even though you now sit at the Father's right hand, you still bother with us. You, through your Spirit, still present with us in all of this life, in all that we go through. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And still there is more because you want more for us. Because of your great love for us, one day, Jesus, you will come again to restore us, to restore your earth and to bring us to be with you, where we can even say with the angels themselves, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. Forgive us, Father for limiting our worship of you to little times, to Sunday mornings, or perhaps an occasional prayer. Forgive us, Father, for not opening our hearts every moment of every day to worship you with all we have. Help us to worship you with our whole lives. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven. The scripture reading for our service today is from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 at verse 13 and reading through to the 11th verse of chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 at verse 13, reading through to chapter 5 verse 11. Listen for the word of God. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left at the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. 
we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Amen. Well, for a few weeks after Easter, we have been looking at what happened next. The death of Jesus clearly was not the end of the story. Christians believe there was a resurrection. Christ had risen. The tomb was empty. And then after spending some 40 days when he appeared at various times in various places to the disciples, and when Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of God, there was the ascension when he left them, making clear that they were to be the body of Christ. They were to be Christ's agents, Christ's people in the world. But he wasn't leaving them alone. No, no, he had promised the Holy Spirit. And a bit later at the day of Pentecost, that promise was fulfilled when the Spirit came upon Jesus' followers, and the Spirit today is still with Jesus' followers. You cannot be a Christian but have the Holy Spirit. But also, as well as the promise that the Spirit would come, Jesus gave these followers another promise that He Himself in person would come again not as a babe born at Bethlehem, but come as, as the Lord of time, come as the sovereign Lord over history. He would come in glory and judge the living and the dead. Stuff that's not always terribly easy to take in. And when we look in the Gospels at Jesus' work with His disciples, we, we see that quite often they didn't get it either. There were times they didn't understand, and they asked questions, and that's to their credit. Asking questions is a good thing. It's not a matter of sin or unbelief to be not sure and to ask a question, and the, the disciples show us that. And, and in Thessalonica, where this le letter had been written by the Apostle Paul, the church there, well, they didn't know everything either. It was a growing church, and they were showing qualities and characteristics of the Christian life in the way that they were living. And they'd stood firm against persecution, and in fact were growing stronger despite it. Paul was just delighted to hear how this young group of believers, and when I say they were a young group of believers, I mean they were only believers for a short, a young time. We have no idea how young or old they were by age, but they were a group of new believers, and Paul was so delighted that they were showing the life of Christ and the way that they lived and standing firm against the persecution. But quite rightly and quite naturally, they had some questions about things. And Paul answers some of these in his letters, including in the letter, including in the passage that we've just read. In the section in chapter 4 at verses 13 to 18, they had questions about the believers who had died. Now, that was because um, some of the church in Thessalonica, and indeed many of the Christians who had become Christians shortly after Jesus' time on earth, they believed that that promise about Jesus coming again was going to happen soon, like next week or next month soon. I suppose that was quite a natural enough thought. Jesus had promised the gift of the Holy Spirit after His ascension. That came quite, quite quickly um, after Jesus had ascended, some 10 days or so. And the, the disciples then probably thought that that coming of Jesus might well be a matter of days or weeks or months. But time was going on, and Jesus hadn't yet come back. And some of the early believers in that time had died. And so the ch folk in the church were a bit worried about this. They believed that Christ was going to come again. When Christ came again, all, his all the believers would be gathered up to meet Jesus. But what about the guys that died last Tuesday or the th Thursday before that? Or are they going to miss out? Have they, have they blown it? 
What's going to happen to these guys? Now, their problem was due to their having wrong ideas or wrong expectations. For Jesus and then the Apostle Paul hadn't said necessarily that Jesus' coming would be soon in terms of weeks and months, but had said that it would be sudden. Everything was in place, and so he might come at any time. And therefore, the believers should be prepared at all times. So, Paul doesn't want them to be uninformed, verse 13. And so, he sets out, sets out a, a short creed, verse 14, and underlines, verse 15, that that's the Lord's teaching. And the creed that he sets out is really in three parts. Firstly, that Jesus himself had died and had risen. And the second, related to the Christians who had died, God will raise them, Paul says, just as he raised Jesus from death. And when Christ returns, it doesn't mean that those who have died recently are being forgotten, not at all. Christ will bring them into the new heaven and the new earth. And then thirdly, the Christians who are still alive at the time who Jesus comes, they will not precede those who have died, but rather they will be brought after them into the kingdom of God to join them all as one family of God. And so all of Christ's people are to be gathered in and with him when he returns. And Paul wrote these words for their encouragement, verse 18. Not even death was going to be able to separate us from the love of God. Death did not mean missing out. Now, that didn't mean that there was no place for grief. Jesus himself had wept at the graveside of his friend Lazarus, John chapter 11. And in verse 13, Paul doesn't say to them, don't grieve, but he says, don't grieve like the rest of humanity who have no hope. Of course, when we experience bereavement, we suffer loss. But it's not the loss that those who do not have any hope, those who have died in the care of Jesus are safe in him. They are not losing out. We experience death as our bereavement as a loss for ourselves, but those who die in Christ have not lost anything. Indeed, they have gained. Weep for yourselves, if you will, says the apostle. But God does not want or imagine that we will be indifferent to the hurts and the losses of the world. But do not weep for those who have died in Christ. They have gained. So that has led him on to speaking about this return of Christ, having assured the church that just because it hasn't happened next last week doesn't mean it's not coming. And in verses 1 to 11 of chapter 5, he goes on to deal a bit more with the return of Christ. What he said in reply to those wondering about those who have died and whether they would receive salvation raised more questions about Jesus' return. When's that going to happen, they might ask. And we might ask as well, it seems to us to have been an awfully long time. When's Jesus coming back, we might ask, just as kids in the back seat of cars down through the years have said, and we're nearly there yet. We have different perspectives on what is a short or what is a long time. And too often people have thought that they'd be able to work out when Jesus was going to be coming back. And up until now, they've always been wrong. But that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. The promise that we read a couple of weeks ago in Acts chapter 1 and that we began our service this morning, that, that, that promise about Christ coming again is made often in Scripture. And just because it's taken longer than some people were expecting doesn't mean that Jesus has got some trouble finding his way here. Jesus himself has promised that he would return at the end of a time, that he would indeed return to judge everyone, that he would usher in the kingdom of God, that he would bring into being the new heavens and the new earth. And the very same Jesus who, when he was walking around Galilee with his disciples and, and promised to them about and told them about his death and resurrection that would come when he got to Jerusalem, that very same Jesus is the one who said that he would return in glory. And he kept the promises, did he not, about his death and about his resurrection, incredible as they would have seemed at the time. And so on what basis... Will any of us say 
that Jesus might have been correct in anticipating his death by crucifixion and in anticipating his resurrection, but coming again would be a stretch too far. If we can trust Jesus for keeping his words in these other ones, surely we can trust him for his word about coming again. But the coming, we're told, verse 2, will be sudden, like a thief in the night. And so the issue for us is not really, is Jesus coming today, or is Jesus coming tomorrow, or is Jesus coming next week, or next month, or next decade? No, the issue for us is not any of these, but how shall we live in the meantime? Given that this life is not all that there is, given that the kingdom of God is coming, Given that we're called to live in the light of that kingdom, what then are we to do and what are we to be like? The apostle says we are to live sitting loose to the attractions of this world, investing our lives rather in the coming kingdom, for a kingdom that is going to last and that will not fade away or be destroyed. We are to live, verse 8 of chapter uh, 5, as people of faith and love. We are to live as people, verse 8, who live with hope. Because this life here is not all that there is. In fact, it's not even the best bit. Better is to come. And to ignore that reality, to ignore that the king is coming and that the judge of the world is coming, is what the apostle means in these verses by sleeping. Now, It might strike us as a wee bit strange that he describes the ungodly life as sleeping, verse 6. So often that it seems to us it might be the the opposite of that. It's going out, it's it's having a good time, it's the razzmatazz of, of life. But it's sleeping in the sense that those who discount Jesus' return, that those who discount Jesus' judgment are kind of like asleep to the real realities of what's going on around them. They're like people who are continuing to party on board the Titanic after it's hit the iceberg. The damage is done. The situation means that much as you like dancing, it's not the best thing to be getting on with at the moment in the circumstances. In the same way, We are not to live lives that are about selfishness, material gain, um, getting ahead of the next guy, pursuing our own personal agendas no matter what. We are to live as people of faith, hope, and love, because Christ is coming again. Christ will judge. Sometimes we, maybe if somebody's on a car journey there, driving along the road and they begin to hear a noise that it's coming from somewhere in the car and it doesn't, doesn't sound too good. So they just turn the radio up a bit louder so that they don't hear it, so that they don't worry about it. Well, that's a bit like that, Paul saying, verse 3. You know, they're saying peace and safety, but in fact destruction is around the corner. And so it doesn't make the problem go away simply by ignoring it. It doesn't make the problem going away by denying it. It doesn't make the problem going away by trying to crowd it out with other things. And so so, no matter how much um, people get on with having big houses or big this or holiday this or holiday that, no matter how much people get on with acquiring this, acquiring that, getting paid a bit more and so on and so on and so on, it cannot cover up the reality that Christ is coming again and Christ will judge. And so we are to live not according to the world's dictates about materialism and consumerism and self-indulgence. Rather, we are to live according to the, the way of Christ, the kind of lifestyle that Jesus described in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And we have to live out that way of Jesus, that faith and hope and love in, in, in the real world. You might remember when it was, or at least we thought it was, relatively safe to travel on aeroplanes and may well have had the experience of traveling a some distance on the plane, and indeed traveling for hours on the plane, and when you get off at the uh, other end of the journey, you're in a completely different time zone. 
And it, it takes our bodies a wee while to adapt, doesn't it? You know, um, <clears throat> whether we've gone one way and at times not quite as late as it, I don't know. You know what I mean. And the time zone thing becomes quite difficult. And, and in the place that you, you are now, you, it, it should be bedtime, but hey, you're not tired yet. Or it should be lunchtime, but you're not hungry yet. And, and, and so our bodies are kind of caught between these two time zones, living partly in the country that we've left and partly in the time that we've, the zone that we've flown to. We're between the two realities. Now, similarly, for Christians now, we, we, there's, a, there's a challenge of two different time zones. There's the, the new life of the kingdom of God that's broken in, but, but still the, the life of here in this world. And one of the consistent and powerful themes running through the letter to the Thessalonians is about how we're to deal with that, and in particular, the importance of dealing with that with one another. Verse 18 of chapter 4, encourage one another with these words. Verse 11 of chapter 5, therefore encourage one another and build each other up. So as we are to help one another to live in the light. You cannot be a Christian for long on your own, says the apostle. We, we are to live in the light of Jesus coming again, and we need one another's help to do that. And it's a command. Encourage one another. Encourage one another and build each other up. Paul's not giving a suggestion here. It's a command. And he meant his commands to be obeyed. And so it's important that as the people of God, we help and encourage and inspire one another to, to live in the light of the fact that Jesus is coming again. Jesus burst on an unsuspecting world when he was born into obscurity in Bethlehem. Yes, there had been lots of talk at the time of Messiah's coming, but by and large, folks were mostly going about their business unaware of what was taking place. Jesus has promised that once more he will burst on an unsuspecting world. But this time, not as a helpless infant born in some obscure place and an occupied country. He will come again, not as one limited to human flesh, but king and judge over all the world. And we need to be ready. Because there are times when it's too late for something to be done. It's too late to do more revision when you're sitting in the hall with the exam paper in front of you. It's too late to try and cash in the five pound off voucher two weeks after the date has expired. It's too late to think about home security after the burglars have been. And it's too late to think about Jesus after we ourselves have died or after he returns. And the only guarantee that we deal with the reality of the judgment of Christ coming is if we get that ourselves sorted out in, re in respect to our life with Jesus, if we get that sorted out now. He might come tomorrow, or it might be as late as Tuesday. Yes, it might be another hundred years. I don't know. But the apostle's point is, is exactly that. We don't know, and so we need to get ready. So have you sorted out your priorities and given your life to Christ? Have you said, I'm going to live a way of, of following Jesus with faith, hope, and love, and put that ahead of the materialism and the consumerism of our world today? Have you said something about the urgency of that, that choice about following Jesus to, to friends, to family members who are blissfully unaware that it's important to sort that out now. For the Christ who was promised 
to his people through the Old Testament prophets and who came at Bethlehem. The Christ who himself said that he would, when he got to Jerusalem that time, be crucified and then rise again. The Christ who had promised to give his Holy Spirit on his people has said that now is the time led by the Spirit to, to live for him because he's coming again. And every work that has been done for the Lord Jesus will be gathered up into the reality of his eternal kingdom. Every act of service, every, every declaration of love will not be wasted because Christ is coming again. The story did not end at Easter. It didn't end certainly at the cross. It didn't even end with resurrection. It hasn't ended with the gift of the Spirit, but indeed comes. There's still more to come. Faith is when we make choices that show that we live believing on the basis of what Jesus has done, that we can trust him for what's still to come. And that trust is not something that's just there in my mind, oh yes, I believe. It's something that has to be lived out in the world. That's what Paul's saying in these verses. And has to be lived out as we follow the distinct and distinctive values of Jesus. For he died for us. So that, verse 10, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the greatness of your coming in Jesus, coming as one of us, coming among us. We thank you too for that promise of his coming again, that his sacrifice for us was not something just as a gesture, it was not some futile attempt to sort something out, but indeed was part of the wonderful movement of your work in a fallen, in a broken, in a hurting world, rebuilding that world till was a time of the fullness of your salvation. Help us to grasp that. Help us to see our place in that. Help us to take our part in that. And to live as people of faith, love, and hope. For Christ is coming again. Amen. I'm going to sing a hymn in a moment about hope, and after we have done so, we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and after the Creed, Miriam is going to be leading us in our prayers for others.
I believe in God. Let us pray. Jesus, our friend, our brother, we worship you. May your name be held in high regard by all. May your name cause us to praise God whenever we hear it. We gather here today in your name, called by God, set free from law and sin through you, Jesus. Help us never to take you for granted and always be thankful for what you have done in our lives, individually and collectively. Be honoured and worshipped in our midst. Father, we thank you for this new season, for lockdown restrictions easing. Many of us are finally able to see friends and family for a long time. Help us all in this transition period to continue to be cautious, but also joyful and hopeful. Help us to plan for the return of the church into the building with foresight and again with joy and hope. We ask you that you would protect us from another dangerous mutation of the COVID virus. Have mercy on our country. Lord, help us to be mindful of those among us who are not yet, for whatever reason, coming out of isolation. Help us to see our neighbour better and be there for those you sent on our path. Holy Spirit, we think of all who are in mourning, those who have lost loved ones either through relationship breakdown or death or debilitating illness. You, the source of all comfort. Comfort those who are grieving in our midst, but also those in our wider society and in particular our Queen Elizabeth. Help her and all of us in mourning to adjust to a new reality, a new season, which will bring with it new burdens as well as new joys. Help us all be mindful of the stages of grief that we find around us or even in ourselves. Be a source of light, hope and joy amidst of mourning and of painful change. Thank you that we do not have to grieve like the world grieves without hope and that even in hurt and loss your purposes are served. Moreover, you have promised that you will turn our tears into laughter, if not in this world, then in the world to come. Jesus in you is life and life in all its fullness. We reach out to you as a congregation, asking you to strengthen us and bring us together again in a time and place where we can gather without fear. Help us never to be ungrateful or take for granted the hard-won liberties in our society. To you be glory and honor. Amen. We began our service with uh, the hymn, O Praise to Thee, which uh, in a sense gathered up that great movement that Paul explains in Philippians chapter 2 of how um, Christ in glory came to us and, and humbled himself for a time and then died, rose and ascended back to, to God for us. And our, our closing hymn will be in something of that same movement at the name of Jesus. Just before we sing, sing that hymn, just to uh, say to folks, there was a Clement calling on the um, 
on our YouTube channels, on Facebook and so on, on the internet um, for Friday past, speaking about some of the things that are going on in, in Claremont in, in May. And there will also be another one um, coming this uh, coming uh, week, probably released on um, Friday the 30th. Do, do, if you get the chance, take time to, to look at them, to keep in touch with what's, what's going on. The Church Magazine will also be, be with you before next weekend. Um, and as I say, there's quite a bit going on in May, and, and, and we'd, we'd love you to be as part of as, as much of that as, as possible. Well, as I say, just as we began with that acclamation of praise to Christ who came and who's gathered us up and has gone ahead of us in glory and who has promised to come again, so we conclude with exactly that, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Thank you.